Good evening, Fkalov Lahiatu, and welcome to tonight's bulletin of BCA News. Leading the news tonight, the vaccination rollout for the children 12 to 15 year olds will start tomorrow with their first dose. We spoke to the head of public health, Griselda Mokoya, about the preparations for tomorrow. Since we've already received our vaccines on Monday, uh, we um, were fortunate to get 180 doses um, from, New from the Ministry of Health of New Zealand. And um, uh, right now we are in the process of finalising all of the consent forms. So the total number of students who are eligible to be vaccinated in the age group, 12 to 15 years, is 160. And in addition to that, we also have 13 adults who will be also included um, in the vaccine rollout um, tomorrow. So up until today, we have received um, 118 consent forms from the parents. So we are hoping that we would reach um, the 160 mark that we're aiming for um, today uh, so that we can confirm all of the appointment times um, that we would like for the parents to bring the kids in for the vaccination tomorrow. Just as it was with the national vaccination rollout in July, the hospital staff are ready to run the same process with the children and the 13 adults tomorrow. Here is Griselda Mokoya again with the run-through of what parents and children can expect tomorrow. Just like we did in our initial national vaccine rollout uh, program, there are six stages. So when the parent and the child arrives, they would also need to reconfirm the information that they have in the consent forms, uh, making sure that they haven't forgotten um, things like if the child is allergic to some of the hospital medications or the child has an underlying medical condition at the time when um, he or she is being escorted to come and get the vaccine. So after that, they'll also need to um, have their vital signs taken. So checking their temperature and their blood pressure and blood sugar, just like how we did for the adults. And then after the vaccination, um, they'll also be required to wait 20 minutes. Uh, that is just so that we will monitor if they had a reaction following the vaccination. And then at, this, at that time also, we would um, um, register them for the QR um, cards uh, so that they'll also be able to take it and keep it for contact tracing purposes. Uh, at the end of it, um, they'll also be given their vaccination cards um, with the date of when they would be required to come back for their second dose. So the second dose of the vaccination is um, after six weeks. Uh, for the kids, so I think it's uh, somewhere around 16th of November. There are though some parents who are still hesitant and some who are asking if their children can take the vaccine at a later date. Um, already we've had parents who have contacted us uh, still double-minded of, of whether or not they would want um, their child to get vaccinated uh, tomorrow. But the process we have is that uh, we would prefer that everyone gets vaccinated um, at the same time because it's a um, huge um, job trying to coordinate everyone to be on the same side at the same time so that we will dedicate um, as much time as we can to look after uh, the child. In addition to that, we had, it's also because of the vaccines, we can only keep it for 31 days. Um, uh, we can still um, do the vaccination for the ones who are not ready but it will not be uh, any time uh, uh, soon, like um, in a month's time or thing. We will need to wait so that we have um, uh, a lot of kids or a certain number of kids because there are six people who are required to use the same vial uh, to be vaccinated at, at any one time. So that's a difficult thing for us. Uh, so those kids, um, the parents have asked if they can also be included, whose birthdays are not far off from Friday. Uh, we will include them um, in that round. For the parents and caregivers, if you don't yet have a copy or signed copy of the consent form, the advice is to just turn up to the new FO hospital tomorrow and the staff will be there to help you. And Cabinet has approved a special envoy to the Conference of Parties or Climate Changes uh, Conference COP26 to be held in Glasgow in Scotland next month. He is Dr. Dean Richmond Rex. He's a pediatric, a Nguyen pediatric surgeon who's been working in London for the last 15 years. Here's more on that story. Premier Dalton Tangilangi said that after deliberations in Cabinet and after consulting with officials in New Zealand, 
given the risks with the pandemic, it was decided that appointing the special envoy was the best decision. Dr. Dean Rex was approached with the invitation to be new special envoy to COP26, to which he accepted. Dr. Rex has been working as a paediatric surgeon in London for the past 15 years. He was last in Niue in September of 2019 for the Pacific Medical Association's conference. Premier Tangelangi said that it has always been his intentions when he was a minister and also when he became premier last year to expand Niue's presence internationally by having representative offices in other countries. It is with these diplomatic aspirations in mind that Cabinet is considering the establishment of representative offices with certain individuals who have approached the government from China and from Japan. When asked why Niue's High Commissioner to Wellington, Honorable Fisa Pingye, was not chosen to represent Niue, Premier Dalton Tangelangi said that it was after discussions with New Zealand officials. It was decided because of the complications of travelling during this pandemic and to minimise the risk of exposure to those people who are not yet vaccinated who will be at this meeting, it was best to use a Niuean already living in Britain to be Niue's special envoy. Premier Tangilangi said that he has every confidence that New Air Special Envoy Dr. Dean Rex will do very well in presenting the government's statement on behalf of the people of New Air at this high-level meeting. The government will not incur any financial costs on the work of the Special Envoy at the conference. The conference will begin on the 1st to the 12th of November in Glasgow, Scotland. And there will be no visiting at the government's quarantine facility when passenger flights resume on Monday the 18th. There will be changes to security as well as protocols, this time according to the Premier, who was on News of the Week's uh, radio programme last Friday. Premier Tangilangi said that the changes to the quarantine protocols is to minimise exposure of our frontline staff directly with the arriving passengers. Security will also be strengthened, which means there will be no visiting of passengers at home office. The government is looking to make sure that on the very first flight that there is either a doctor or nurse on that flight. Uh, this time round, it's going to be changed. It's not going to be like the same. The security will be bolstered, meaning that there will be no uh, visitors at all. You can just drop off um, it, to ensure um, uh, that safety. And we also... Um, those that will be on the first flight uh, to ensure that there's a um, qualified doctor or a qualified nurse on that flight, meaning that our health staff here will not be visiting to monitored but can be monitored by uh, that person, that medical person. So we reach out to PM, uh, PMA as well uh, for our very own that we can happy to fund them to be part of their group uh, and they keep an eye while they're in isolation. The Premier said that the government has a moral responsibility to bring our people home, but the government is very cautious because there are still community cases of the Delta variant in Auckland right now, hence the decision to minimise exposure of our people to the passengers. Taking all the advice uh, we receive working closely with the Ministry of Health in New Zealand, also Dr Colin, and uh, we have come to that decision. As you know, we have a moral obligation also to those people of ours and we can't keep them away. We have to find a way uh, of bringing them home. So uh, on both ends on those uh, discussions, we're happy that uh, we can resume on the 18th. I would really like to start next week, but too short of a time uh, in order for us to prepare and get ready. He said that the government understands the virus may very well enter Niue at some stage, but for now they will try their very best to keep it out for as long as they can. These changes to quarantine and security protocols will hopefully ensure that we keep Niue free from COVID-19. Passengers are limited to up to 20 people per flight and especially for the first few flights. The first flight will arrive on Monday the 18th of October. There are at least 100 locals stranded in New Zealand including several members of parliament and several senior public servants. The volunteer group The Rock Vets have expressed concerns that their communications to the government's Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries were not being acknowledged. The Rock Vets, in an email to BCN News, claim that the government have also not paid or reimbursed them for med- animal medications that they have been sending out to the island. Here's more on that story. 
In an email to BCN News, the Rock Vets say that they have been told that they will be provided with a government budget for supplies, but as yet they have not received any payment for dog and cat medicines. For the last two years, they say that they have had to pay for all the supplies they have sent to Niue and they have not received any reimbursement. According to the Rock Vets, the new government have never given them any assistance financially and that there has been a lot of we will look into it and get back to you, but with zero progress. BCN News contacted the Director of the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and the Minister of Natural Resources, Honourable Mona Ainu, who said that she is very surprised at these allegations because the government has been supportive of the Rock Vets but that she also has concerns about the lack of an MOU or a Memorandum of Understanding between the government and the Rock Vets. Firstly, with the operational um, element of our ministry, I leave that up to the department, obviously. However, I have been um, uh, meeting with the um, director in regards to these concerns. Um, I also have concerns. Um, I acknowledge the... Um, the good work that has been undertaken by the Rock Vets since they've been uh, on the island. Um, but as we all know, originally the, um, the organization that we dealt with was Spores. Um, however, Rock Vet, um, I guess, I was um, part of the, the Spores group. Um, so when all these happened, um, there has unfortunately, there has not been a memorandum of understanding, which makes it hard for us to to, uh, I guess, um, have that ro- more robust relationship with rock beds. Um, in regards to the operations and the funding, um, I'm very surprised that we have not, um, that we, that the rock beds have, have uh, voiced their concerns that the, the government has not, or the department has not assisted with any funding at all, which I am <coughs> very surprised because I know we have appropriated a, a budget to assist uh, we also have the in-kind contribution, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that must account for something. Uh, you know, with the premises we've uh, supplied, we've also uh, used some of our staff, our personnel, to assist them when, when they're here. So saying that um, the government has not or has ignored that, um, their request to communicate uh, properly or have that um, uh, more robust communication channel uh, in place, I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised. Um, and so from what I got from the, uh, di- from the director is that um, we have um, contributed um, and so I guess the thing that we need to establish is the MOU and by saying that also establishing in the MOU um, we will obviously have this partnership will have to be a little bit more open than what it is now. Um, as you know, without an MOU, we're not obligated. They are not obligated. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that we are not going to help. Um, we also have assistance from SBC, which we have been dealing with over the years. So that um, that sort of communication is, is something that I'm concerned that you know they have brought that up or they have raised that that we have not been communicating back to rock bands. Because of the unpaid and unacknowledged communications, the Rock Vets have said that they will not be sending any more animal medication to the government until these invoices are addressed. The Rock Vets also claim that they have been waiting for the government to provide recognition for the two vets who work the clinics for New Air, but that is not the case, according to the minister. Well, I'm pretty sure that's not correct. Um, one of the uh, the vets that were originally proposed by Rock Vets to be recognised by the government, as I said, with, without an MOU, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to to have that um, <clears throat> the partnership as such. But we we do recognise um, Brian, who is the initial vet. Um, however, Rock Vets also have just uh, proposed to also recognise another veterinarian, which we would have to have dialogues with them rather than, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not too keen on the demanding part on, on government. I don't deal with, um, with that type of um, demand, but, you know, everything is possible if there is, uh, if we have to discuss with them and obviously uh, uh, advice from the director as a way forward. 
The Director of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, Poyo Kesene, told BCA News that they will be working to reconcile their accounts to find out exactly how much has been paid for the medications for animals and to address these concerns raised by the rock vets. Meanwhile, Minister Ainu says that there are funds appropriated for the work of animal welfare in the government's budget. So we appropriated funding um, in the last financial year and we will continue to appropriate funding. Um, It is very difficult for us with a very limited budget to work from. Um, However, we have also uh, provided a supporting letter for uh, rock vets. Obviously, um, there is a funding source from outside for rock vets. Um, However, they are claiming that they're not um, assisted by any donor. Um, So um, um, I, I think as a way forward, we need to have the MOU established so we're able to have a, I guess a, the, the logistics will be a little bit more, um, a bit more open and, um, and yeah, as a way forward, this needs to happen. But they also need to come to the table and obviously they will need to disclose their financials and we would need to sit down and go through with our budget as to where to pull our funding from and also where we can work, um, I guess, foster their relationship because it's, it is hard for us to get assistance and we appreciate all assistance that we get on the island, but also we, they, um, as an NGO, need to also understand they have to be more open than what it is now. Rock vets normally visit Niue once a year to provide animal health clinics on a voluntary basis, but they have not been able to continue their service since the pandemic. There are volunteers on the island like Robin Ongoto, who was trained by rock vets in New Zealand to administer hormone implants to help control the breeding of animals on the island and to reduce the number of feral animals. And continuing with our series of stories leading up to COP26, BCN News spoke with the senior advisor to the Director General of SBC, Ms. Coral Pasisi, on climate finance, uh, science and security issues for small island states like Niue, who are at the precipice of the impacts of climate change. Koropa Sisi is one of the region's foremost experts on climate finance, which is one of the key concerns Pacific leaders have expressed leading up to COP26, the challenges of accessing funding to respond to the impacts of climate change. I think wherever possible, small island states should pursue bilateral climate finance assistance into the mechanisms that are commensurate with their own absorptive capacity, whether that's through budget support in a government, whether it's through trust fund arrangements. Um, and I think this is where Minister Monainu had raised that New is developing you know, its own innovative financing uh, mechanism around ocean conservation and sustainability. And that uh, is developed commensurate with our own systems. Uh, and so if we can get climate finance into something like that, it's much easier for us to disperse in the community systems the way that you know people are used to spending resources. I think that the final thing, and I think one of the most important things for me, is the capacity of small states to understand climate change, let alone manage the funding to uh, address it, is a capacity that is required because of climate change. So it's not something we created, but we have to develop a workforce and pay for it to address it. So for me, that capacity should be funded by climate finance. That's the first incremental cost to a country to have to address climate change. So I think we should be arguing for direct budgetary support to fund all the capability that is required by small island states to even start addressing uh, climate change. On the subject of the science and after the release of the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC report last month, Ms. Parsisi says that the scientists have now realized that they will need to impart not just the scientific facts, but share their opinions, which will hopefully see changes at these types of meetings. We have a lot of science on it now. We still aren't 100% sure you know, at what, what rates is, is, are things going to unfold? Uh, and we can already see the science has actually underestimated the impact on many things. And that's partly because the, science, the scientists of the world and the IPCC do the assessment. Scientists never 
say I think it's going they only speak to the absolute facts of what they can you know be definitively uh, sure of and then that report goes to the member states and parties of the convention who then go through it and water it down as much as they can some of the countries so it becomes even less um, you know accurate or or as robust as it could be but scientists now are starting to say actually this is such a serious issue that we think we have to give our opinion on top of the facts so now we're starting to get a lot more uh, strong and out there messaging last year Koropa Sisi presented a statement to the United Nations Security Council on the precarious situation faced by small island states and the magnitude of the impacts they face because of climate change. Pasisi says that climate change is the ultimate security concern of the world. It is everyone's business to understand it at least, understand what those impacts are going to be and wherever possible responds uh, accordingly. But as we've seen the science become more and more clear around the, the magnitude of impact to small island states in, the, in this region, uh, it is a security issue for them. It is it is an, a security issue at national level jurisdictional certainty around the EEZs. Uh, it is a security issue around the economic stability of a country. So we've seen the tuna migration issue for many countries in the Pacific will cause drops up to 20% in their revenues. Um, which, you know, where do they then get the money to invest in their schools and, and hospitals? Uh, and then it's a personal one for people who will have to be displaced out of coastal areas and off some low-lying atolls uh, because they lose their access to their culture, their children no longer inherit the traditional knowledge associated with those resources and that culture, they have to move somewhere else. So uh, my briefing to the UN Security Council was to appreciate from a small island developing state's perspective in the Pacific why this is a security issue across those key areas so that they understand it might not be on their agenda now but if they don't do something to address it it will be on their agenda at some point in time. And BCN News will continue to bring you stories uh, over the next couple of weeks on the lead up to COP26. In other news Two children were attacked last weekend by dogs. One of the parents sent pictures to BCN News showing the injuries on her child from the dog attack. However, the police department said that they were not aware of the attacks, but that they have been culling or they have started or restarted their elimination um, program on unregistered and feral dogs. This started three months ago. Public concerns at the increasing of packing or dogs travelling in packs is not new, which has prompted the police to resume their elimination program. Earlier this week, Niue police confirmed that they have eliminated about 20 strays or dogs without collars. Sergeant Jackson said that they have improved the animal elimination process with an estimated 90% success rate. The arms officer using new firearms also used traps to contain the animal. The police said that in the strictest safety conditions, they will not eliminate animals if there are children within the vicinity. So with the upcoming school holidays, they will suspend their program until the children return to school. And the weather wasn't very good last Saturday for the last day of Avaseli's Marine Week, but that didn't matter much because the fishermen were very happy with their catch, especially 62-year-old Pule Hopukingi, who caught the largest fish of the competition, a black marlin weighing in at 115.15 kilos. Here's Sana Sioniholo with more. Pule told PCN News that after decades of fishing, he finally caught the big one in his vaca. The giant fish was caught just off the coast at Avasele Bay. It took Pule and his son Heston about 45 minutes to haul in the fish just before 9 a.m. Another impressive catch and personal best for Daniel Makaya, who caught a massive 10.5 kilogram rusty job fish from his canoe as well. Matthew Jessup also won the prize for the heaviest tuna at just over 26 kg. Overall, a very successful marine week for the village of Avaseli. 
And that's our bulletin of BCN News for tonight. Do join the Avaseli Village for their annual uh, Village Show Day this coming Saturday. I understand they'll be rolling corned beef on Saturday as well. But uh, join us again on Tuesday next week for our bulletin in Vangahau. Until then, good night, nonofoa.